Well, hey folks, welcome back to another Timber Talk Tuesday. I'm Ricky McLean with Woodworks. We know that in mass timber buildings, one of the highlights of using the product is that we can expose it as the structural material, the architectural finish, and use that to achieve a fire resistance rating that is required by the building code. There are two separate and distinct ways to actually demonstrate that fire resistance rating, and the path you take really starts to dictate what are some of the follow-on options. So in today's video, we're gonna break down the two options for demonstrating fire resistance ratings for mass timber members. Come along for the journey. Generally speaking, when we start designing a mass timber building or any building for that matter, there are really four options that we're generally going to face when it comes to needing to demonstrate a certain level of fire resistance rating. Those four options are a zero hour fire resistance rating, which would really be limited to types 5B construction and type 3B construction for the interior elements of the building. A half hour rating, 30 minute rating, and that is typically required in those 3B and 5B buildings, but specifically for multifamily occupancies where walls and floor assemblies that separate one dwelling unit from another or dwelling units from public spaces, those require a minimum 30 minute protection in a 5B and 3B building. One hour fire resistance rating, and I would say that's the most common, and that's for something like a 5A construction, a 3A construction. It may also apply to other construction types like 4HT, like 3B, like 5B, if there's requirements for occupancy separation or at shaft walls, things like that. And then a two hour fire resistance rating, and that's going to apply mainly to the taller mass timber construction types, 4C, 4B, and 4A. And the other thing that I'll mention here, which applies across all four of the type four options, 4HT, 4C, 4B, and 4A, is that in addition to the fire resistance rating requirements, which is what this video is going to focus on, those specific construction types also require a minimum size for all of the interior mass timber elements. And so this is something that's dictated in chapter 23 of the International Building Code, where you look at the element that you're designing, whether it's a floor beam, a roof deck, floor deck, a column, etc. And chapter 23 in IBC will dictate specifically what is the minimum size that that timber element needs to be. Of course, it can be larger, but if sized out structurally to be less than that, you would have to bump up that minimum size to meet both the minimum sizes, as well as the required fire resistance rating. All right, so first you're gonna to turn to chapter six in IBC and table 601 is going to dictate the required fire resistance ratings for a number of elements. And primarily these are structural elements. So let's say you're type 3A construction, you're looking at the primary structural frame, the beams and columns. This is gonna tell us that we need a one hour fire resistance rating. Similarly, if we're type 4B construction and we're designing a floor assembly, we turn to table 601 and we see that we need a two hour fire resistance rating. In addition to table 601, there are other aspects of the code which could apply that you'd want to make sure that your building is in compliance with things like occupancy separation section 508 things like multifamily dwelling occupancy separations look at the horizontal assembly provisions in chapter 7 the fire partition provisions in chapter 7 are you designing shaft walls fire barriers are you designing fire walls so those are some other aspects of the code that you'd want to look at to make sure that you do have the required fire resistance rating for the element that you're designing. Now, once we know what that required fire resistance rating is, now we turn to section 703 of IBC, and this lists a number of ways that we can actually demonstrate how the element that we're designing meets that required fire resistance rating, right? We have the code telling us on one hand, this is the required fire resistance rating. On the other hand, then we have to demonstrate how are we meeting that required fire resistance rating. And really the two options that apply to exposed mass timber elements, whether those are beams or columns or floor decks, is one method that's based on fire testing. This is based on an ASTM E119 furnace fire test. And the other option is through using calculations. Now, if we are going the testing route, there are a number of E119 fire tested assemblies. Woodworks has compiled all of the publicly available fire tested mass timber assemblies that we're currently aware of. Currently, there are over 50 of those, and you can find a link down in the comments of this video to directly access that inventory of fire tested assemblies. We'll get into the nuances of those tests in just a minute. The second option that we can use is, as I mentioned, calculations. And what the code says here is that IBC points to section 722 of IBC, which points to chapter 16 
of the NDS, the National Design Specification for Wood Construction. This is an American Wood Council document, a code referenced standard. So there is a direct code path to this document. And IBC says if you are designing the fire resistance rating of exposed wood members and wood decking, then you can use this document, chapter 16 of this NDS document, to demonstrate those fire resistance ratings up to a two hour fire endurance. All right, so first diving more deeply into the calculation method. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time in this video walking through how to actually go about those calculations because we've actually done a video on those char calculations in the past. You can check that out in the upper right hand corner here, a link to that video. But what I do wanna mention here is that there are some additional steps which you can take to better leverage the capabilities of specifically panel, specifically CLT floor panels when using the calculation method. Essentially, there are, there are several options that we can use when doing calculated fire resistance ratings of mass timber floor assemblies. And again, I'm gonna focus right here specifically on CLT because of the fact that CLT is a bi-directional orientation in terms of the layers of the laminations within that panel. The odd number applies, the top, middle, and bottom, let's say if it's a five ply CLT, are spanning what we call the major axis or the strong axis of the panel. And then the intermediate layers, the even number of plies, the second and fourth layers in this five ply example are spanning in the minor axis or the weak axis direction of the panel. Now what that results in is if we're designing this panel in a one way spanning system, as we would commonly do, after a say one hour fire resistance rating in a typical CLT floor panel that has one and three eighths lamination thicknesses, what chapter 16 of NDS will tell us is that the effective char depth after one hour on this specific CLT panel is 1.9 inches. Now, if we look at the cross section of, again, this five ply CLT floor panel, we take out 1.9 inches of the bottom of the panel. You can see that's going to remove the entire first lamination and then partially into the second lamination. Now, because of the second lamination being in the minor axis or weak axis direction of the panel, typically what we would do is neglect that second lamination for its entire thickness, essentially leaving us with a three ply panel effective in a post fire condition. Now, keep in mind, it's not as bad as it may seem in terms of the structural capacity, because we do get to bump up those structural capacities based on the factors within chapter 16 of NDS. So specifically, if we're designing this panel in a post fire condition for bending, we can increase the allowable bending properties on that panel by a factor of 2.85. So essentially, we've started out with a five ply six and seven eighths inch thick CLT floor panel. We're checking that in the non-fire condition structurally. Then in the post one hour fire condition, we've basically reduced that to a three ply CLT panel, but we can increase the allowable properties of the three ply, not of the five ply, but we increase the allowable properties of the three ply by a factor of 2.85. Now let's look at a few alternate scenarios. Let's say instead of a five ply starting out, we want to start out with a three ply. And we want to say, can we get a one hour fire resistance rating with a three ply panel? Well, again, we have the same effective char depth, that 1.9 inch char depth, because that's, that's a factor of the fire resistance rating and the thickness of the laminations. It's not a factor of the overall thickness of the panel. So again, three ply panel, 1.9 inch effective char depth. We remove all of the lowest layer and partially into the second layer because that second layer is in the minor or weak axis of the panel. We're going to neglect that. And essentially what we're left with is just a single layer two by flat material, inch and three eighths thick that is spanning in the panel's strong axis. So we can then calculate what are the structural properties of a two by or essentially inch and three eighths flat element spanning in its strong direction with the 2.85 increase factor because of the fact that it's such a thin member the span capabilities aren't going to be large but we can still calculate a spanning capability and so that's what we would want to be checking against for our designed grid and and spacing between the, the beam elements the other thing to keep in mind here is that we would want to also factor in the deflection of this panel, where even if we can get something to calc out from a bending stress capacity, we also want to factor in the anticipated deflection of something like a single two by flat in a post fire scenario. And to take this example a little bit further, let's say now we're designing a five ply CLT panel for a two hour fire resistance rating, like we would have say in a type 4C or 4B construction type. So now we turn to chapter 16 of NDS and we see that for a two hour fire resistance rating with lamination thicknesses of inch and three eighths, the effective char depth is 3.8 inches. 
Now, if we take 3.8 inches off the bottom of that five ply panel, you'll see what we get is all of the lowest lamination is charred through, all of the second lamination is charred through, and a little bit of that third lamination, the middle lamination is charred through. But that's still a strong axis or major axis lamination, so we could just completely neglect it because it's partially charred, but then we would be completely neglecting the lamination above, so we would basically end up in the same condition that we had with that three ply after one hour in this five ply after two hour, meaning just the single two by flat spanning in the strong axis. But the alternative now with this five ply two hour system that we can look at is because of the fact that that partially charred third lamination is in the strong axis or the major axis of the panel, we can use something that's called the shear analogy method to calculate the adjusted properties, the section modulus and adjusted properties of this CLT panel accounting for the fact that we do have strong axis laminations top and bottom, but the thickness of that bottom lamination is not the same as the thickness of the top lamination. Now, if you're looking for some tips on how to actually go about those shear analogy calculation processes, Appendix X3 of the 2019 version of the PRG320 standard, which by the way, the PRG320 standard is the production standard for CLT core cross laminated timber. And you can access that for the link again that I'll post down in the description here. So appendix X3 of this document goes through some of those calculations that you'll need. Also the 2019 version of the Canadian CLT handbook also has some useful calculations that you would wanna take a look at when going through this shear analogy method. Now the second option for demonstrating fire resistance ratings of exposed mass timber members, in addition to the calculation method, which we just described, is citing fire tested assemblies. We mentioned at the beginning of this video that there's the ASTM E119 fire test standard, which over 50 mass timber assemblies have been tested and are documented in the Woodworks fire testing inventory. And as you start to dial in on those available fire tested assemblies, let's say you're looking for, again, this example of a five ply, two hour rated CLT floor assembly. So if you can dial those parameters into the inventory, you can start to see what the options are. Currently there are approximately eight such tested assemblies with the exposed ceiling side, five ply floor assembly, two hour fire resistance rating. Now, one of the things to keep in mind here is as you look at this chart, you can see that they weren't all tested for the same loading conditions, nor for the same span. A lot of times these are gonna be functions and limitations of the specific furnace or test setup where the test was run and how much load could be applied and what the size of the furnace was and therefore what the allowable span of that member was. Now, one possible way to go about checking these systems for something other than what they were specifically tested for in terms of span or loading, and this is something that does require engineering judgment and discussion with your building official, but let's say you were to look at one of those tested assemblies and it was tested at a load of 100 pounds per square foot and a span of 12 feet. One of the things you might look at doing is then calculating, well, what was the actual bending moment at that load and span condition? And then what would the allowable span be based on the actual loading conditions that your project has and kind of start to rework the numbers there based on the actual bending moment that was a function of the system. Keeping in mind that you would also want to check deflection because in many cases these may be deflection controlled members. And the last thing that I'll mention on these topics is that thermal separation is also a criteria of the E119 fire test and is one of the failure modes or failure checks that an E119 fire test has, whereas the NDS chapter 16 calculations don't have those thermal checks, but there is a process to check for the thermal rise on the unexposed side of the mass timber floor assembly. That is contained in the American Wood Council's document TR10, Technical Report 10, as well as the fire design specification also produced by the American Wood Council. And again, I will link to those documents in the description down below so you can check out those thermal check calculations as well. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope that you found this discussion on methods for demonstrating fire resistance ratings and exposed mass timber members helpful. If you have ideas or suggestions on topics for future videos, please let me know. Leave a comment down below. Shoot me a note. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to have these conversations be interactive and helping you solve some challenges on your mass timber projects. And again, reach out to us here at Woodworks. If you have questions, we're happy to help. We are a free resource to you. Well, that's it for today's video. I thank you so much for making it till the end. And until next time, we'll see you later.